Collins. You're probably the most prominent uh, sociologist working in the field of natural sciences. Um, wow. But let's let's start from the beginning. I, as a sociologist, you can do other things. So I wondered how you came to science and physics in general. I uh, saw your definition of science at the end of one of your books, which refers to Wittgenstein's family resemblances. So I thought that might be a motive. So how did it come about that you choose the natural sciences as your study of object of study? Well, the, often these things happen by accident. Uh, when I was doing my master's degree at the University of Essex in 1970-71, uh, I had to choose uh, a, dis a, a dissertation project at the end of the master's to do a little dissertation. And I thought it would be interesting to go into science laboratories because my school exams were, were in science. So I thought it would be interesting. I hadn't been in a science laboratory for years. I thought it would be interesting to visit science laboratories again. And eventually I settled to deciding to study how scientists learn to build a new kind of laser called a transversely excited atmospheric pressure carbon dioxide laser. So I, uh, there was one of these being built in the University of Essex. I went to talk to them and I found out all the other people in Britain who were trying to build these lasers and I got in my car and I drove to all these other laboratories and I asked them, how did you learn to build this laser? And the result turned out to be very interesting. Um, what I had in mind, as you said, I was interested in the philosophy of science and interested in philosophical topics and I was interested in Wittgenstein's idea of a form of life. And I thought the way I would look at this business of learning to build a laser would be as people coming to be inducted or socialized into a new form of life, the form of life of laser builders. This thing, by the way, is called a transversely excited atmospheric pressure CO2 laser. We call it the T laser for short, T, like this <laughs> stuff. We call it the T laser for short. So this would be the T laser form of life. Mm -hmm. And so I went around and I said, well, how did you get to learn to build this laser? And it turns out I was lucky because building one of these lasers was very difficult. And so you could re read the circuit diagram, you could read the paper, you could read the description, you could put the whole thing together, only about this big, and it wouldn't work. And the only people who made them work were people who had spent time in somebody else's laboratory where they already had one working. And this fitted very nicely with my idea that this was more socialization than technical information transfer. Because it, it was not the uh, transfer of information one thinks about when exactly. about science, publishing papers and reading the descriptions. It was, well, some implicit knowledge. Exactly. Tacit knowledge, as, it, yeah. as, it, as it's known. It was certain sorts of skills, certain sorts of things you, you had to do mm -hmm. to make it work. And people didn't know they were doing them. Mm -hmm. But if they'd been to another laboratory where they already worked, they would do things in the same way and so their laser would work. But if they just took it from the circuit diagram, then it probably wouldn't work. Well, it never did work, actually. I mean, that was just lucky. And it was a very clean result. So that's how I started. And this paper was quite, this study was quite successful. And then I carried on. And uh, then I then wanted to say, well, this is, I've seen how this transfer of knowledge works in a science where, which isn't very competitive. Mm -hmm. Now I want to compare it with a more competitive science. So I look for some more competitive science. And then I found this controversy over gravitational waves, which I did a, decided to do a comparison with for my PhD. Mm -hmm. Also some other things like parapsychology, which was very controversial too. So let me just touch um, other other fields of, of science in which a sociologist could work as well. Um, uh, gravitational waves is, is certainly something something very special, and uh, but 
by investigating science as a general. You did, I think you did a great service to science by investigating these things, how opinions are established. Um, there are other fields like uh, cosmology. Cosmology sometimes is said to be very consensus-driven or authority-based. And, and you also once criticized this face of God interpretation of the cosmic microwave background. Was that uh, that you preferred these uh, gravitational waves, um, science over, say, cosmology or other fields? Or? Well, there were two things that I, I was looking for. First of all, I wanted... A, a, a re I wanted to investigate um, science. I didn't want to investigate vague sciences. I wanted to investigate sciences which uh, were were clean and clear and not political, not politically driven. So I wouldn't want, want to investigate the safety of tobacco. I wouldn't want to investigate. Uh, anything to do with climate change, not that climate change was a big deal in those days, but I wanted something that was just plain science, so that if I could show the sociological nature of something that was just plain science, then it would apply to all sciences. Whereas if you did it, say, for economics, people would say, oh, well, that's just economics. When you got to physics, it's nothing like that. But I wanted to get to something like physics to start off with, so that if I could show this for physics, then it applied to everything. And the other thing I was looking for is something, as I might say, that I could get my arms around. I wanted to see experiments. So the tea laser, I could see the experiment on the bench and I could talk to the scientists about the experiment. And the same applied to gravitational waves. There you could go and see the experiment and people were arguing about the experimental result. That's much better than arguing about vague things like cosmology if you really want to do a sociological investigation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think that there is something special in, in because uh, gravitational waves are very has very clear cut definitions of, of the experiment. Um, uh, there are other sociologists working, for instance, in, in the field of particle physics. Um, particle physics has pretty much complication in a in a, a Kuhnian sense. So was it also this why you preferred gravitational waves or did was that a matter of consideration? Uh, I mean not really. There's a lot of very many parameters, but in gravitational waves you have say just one theory on no, I, I think this is too complicated. When you're starting research you mm -hmm. you stumble around mm -hmm. and you find something. Yeah, yeah, I mean a lot of the time you the the the, mm -hmm. the, the crucial trick of doing good research is to make the best of what you come across. Mm -hmm. So in fact, as I've always said this, none of my research projects, none of my good research projects have ever worked out as I expected them to work out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something's always gone wrong mm -hmm. and then you have to say, oh, what am I going to do now? Mm -hmm. So in fact, this uh, research project on the gravitational waves went completely wrong. Mm -hmm. um, after I after I'd been investigating it, and I uh, for my PhD, I bought an old car. Excuse me, I drove across America, interviewing everybody doing gravitational wave research. And only as I was driving uh, through Nevada, approaching the West Coast, did I realise. Well, wait a minute. My T laser project this worked because I could tell whether somebody had got a working T-laser. If the T-laser worked, it produced a very powerful beam of radiation and everybody could see that the T-laser was working. Mm -hmm. And so I knew who had a successful one and who didn't have a successful one. Mm -hmm. But suddenly I realised when I was driving across Nevada, and this gave me a terrible fright, mm -hmm. that I didn't know who had a successful gravitational wave detector. Mm -hmm. Some people said the gravitational wave detectors that could see gravitational waves were the successful ones. Mm -hmm. Some said the gravitational wave detectors that couldn't see gravitational waves were the detect the successful ones. And I suddenly thought, oh no, I've wasted all this money driving across the United States. I've completely ruined my PhD. It's a disaster. Mm -hmm. And then only after about 20 minutes thinking, I suddenly began to think, well, wait a minute. If I don't know who's got a successful gravitational wave detector, then the scientists don't know either. And that is a much more interesting problem. So, you know, it was an accident. Mm -hmm. And most of my re good research has turned out yeah. terrible.
to have accidents like this. In fact, nowadays, if I don't let something funny and peculiar happen, mm -hmm. I worry about it. I think, this is going too well. There must be something wrong here. <laughs> yes, so much insecurity and so much lack of certainty. One of the things you mentioned at, at the definition of science, uh, still in this, in this field of gravitational field, uh, gravitational waves, I mean, um, I think I think there is so much uncertainty, and yet it's uh, in in the in the realm of physics. It's one of the most clean methodologies, the most uh, the cleanest methodologies, because you have this incredible um, acid test of of uh, of coincident waves, and not uh, the, the the difficulty of background removal is, is much. Um, it, it's much, much easier because you have this, this coincidence test and uh, I think this is, you think that gravitational waves uh, detection has, a, has an advantage for that reason? Well, you see, this is, this is how the sociology of science works. You take something which on the face of it is very simple just in the way you describe it but when you look at the detail, it turns, to, turns out to be incredibly complicated. Yeah, yeah. So in fact, you know, over the years, there have been at least, say, half a dozen claims to have seen gravitational waves using this coincidence method, but they've all gone into the waste paper basket. This last event, the astonishing thing about it is that people accepted it so readily because for nearly 50 years, People have been claiming to see gravitational waves and other people have been saying, no, they're not real. So even though the experiment looks very clean and easy, or in fact, no experiment is clean and easy. This is a myth about science. And I think it's a myth that, that the sociologists have been able to uncover. There is no clean and easy experiment. The, hi the histories of science, which write everything up as very straightforward and not involving any real labor or work, are wrong. When you examine each, any of these famous experiments in detail, they've been disputed, they've been, people disagree with them. Let's take the most, one of the most famous experiments in, in the history of science, the Michelson-Morley yeah. experiment. Everybody says, oh, in 18, what is it, 1878 or something, Michelson and Morley showed that there was, uh, the speed of light was a constant, and there was no ether drift. But it's just not true. It took fif at least 50 years for people to agree that the results of the Michelson-Morley experiment were genuine. Yeah, I think this is one of the big insights you, you, you provided to science, that it's not that easy and it's not a matter of uh, the experiment being the judge of, of uh, two options, truth and true and wrong. So there's much more in between. Um, yet I think that you still believe that there is something real behind, that there is a reality. There are some sociologists who would even claim that, well, I don't know what reality is. Uh, it, reality is what scientists agree upon. But you think there is a, uh, still a, a real background? Uh, it's not my business. I'm a sociologist. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't care whether there's a real background or not. Mm -hmm. What I do is I say when I do my work, mm -hmm. if I'm concentrating on the detection of gravitational waves, it's certainly no good me saying, oh, look, the scientists came to believe in gravitational waves because gravitational waves are real. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, why would that, why should anybody pay me to say that? Anybody could say that. <laughs> okay? So I have to say, no. What I have to explore is why people came to believe in gravitational waves. And to do that exploration properly, I have to work on the assumption that they're not real. Now that's a methodological demand. Mm -hmm. it, it's not a philosophical statement about reality. And I'm not in the business of making philosophical you, statements about reality. You're saying that you need to assume that they do not exist if you properly want to properly investigate? You need to assume that the reasons that people came to believe in things was not because nature forced them to believe. Yeah, you could write that. Nature forced them to believe. Okay, what does it mean? <laughs> so we have to do a different kind of work. Now, 
one of the ways in which the focus of my work has changed over the last uh, 10 or more years, 10 or 20 years, is that I think in, in spite of this methodology, which I stick to very rigidly, we must still find a way of saying why we value science in Western societies. And uh, for that reason, the focus of my work has... It's, the old work still carries on. I'm still writing about gravitational waves and so on. But a new focus of my work is also expertise. I don't think you can make any sense of society yeah, yeah. unless you think that s and accept that some people are more expert than others. You see, if... That's your new book. Or, or, or various books, yeah, 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 various books. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's obvious, here you've come all the way from Munich to interview me. Mm -hmm. Why bother? If there's no such thing as expertise, why didn't you just interview your next-door neighbour? <laughs> So if we're going to make sense of what we do, we have to assume that there is something called expertise. So for quite a few years now, among other things, I've been exploring the nature of expertise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in, I think it was uh, at the beginning of, of Gravity's Shadow, you, uh, you wrote that uh, in the not-so-far future, scientists will agree that gravitational waves uh, are detected. So uh, this is for you the same thing. Uh, gravitational waves exist or are detected or uh, scientists will agree that they are detected. Yeah. yeah. It's the same. I mean, it's the, from as far as my, my question for the l latest detection of gravitational waves is why did everybody agree so quickly okay. that this was a real event? I've been studying this field now of gravitational wave detection for 44 years. And all the time during those 44 years, people have been saying, I found gravity waves, and other people have been saying, no, you haven't. And people have been saying, yes, I have. No, you haven't. Yes, I have. No, you haven't. So I've been studying scientific controversy and how scientific controversy comes to a close. And then suddenly... In 2015, there is a discovery and there is no controversy. And this is very strange. And so my physicist friends, because I talk to the physicists all the time, and some of the physicists in this field are now my genuine friends, and they say to me, oh, there you are, Harry. This shows you that nature has really shown us something. This is no longer a sociological controversy. And I have to deal with this, you know. What, why is it that everybody agrees? And I agree as well, mind you. I've seen these but results. But you expect that, in a way, that well, with advanced legal, that this will happen? Yes and no. Yes, we expected it because you could see where everything was going, because the latest generation of detectors was so sensitive that it ought to be seeing gravitational waves, that thus, before these detectors went on air, uh, journalists were calling me up and saying, uh, what's going to happen if advanced LIGO doesn't see gravitational waves? Then that, that will be a problem. Yeah, that's interesting. That's an interesting yeah. question. Yeah. And I had to say, well, it won't be too much of a problem because it won't affect the theory of relativity. It won't affect the theory of the way the machines work. The thing it might affect is astrophysics. There may not be so many astrophysical events emitting gravitational radiation. And, uh, but then, you know, then it suddenly happened. We suddenly saw this mm -hmm. big mm -hmm. event. But that was your expectation. What about the expect expectation of the, of the community? Um, I think there were, you, you, uh, you, you quoted one or two uh, statements of the community and um, yeah, I think that, that the community was expecting very much the, the discovery. They really committed to the, uh, to the discovery. Do you think that, what, what's, your, what's your estimate of the people who, the percentage people who are really convinced that advanced LIGO will produce that kind of signal? Well, you've got to be, you've got to be con in convinced enough to be ready to spend $250 million on it. And so, and they have to be able to convince the funding agency that they should spend $250 million on advanced LIGO. So you could say to that extent they were convinced. 
But on the other hand, you know, people have been expecting to see gravity waves for, for, for nearly 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, not quite as convinced as, it, as this case, because this, this time advanced LIGO fits better with the theory. But I don't think anybody expected to see a strong gravitational wave so suddenly. They were thinking, well, maybe in about two or three years' time, when the machine has shaken down, because it hasn't reached its predicted level of sensitivity yet. But there were people uh, saying, unless something is very wrong, by that time Adeligo will have shaken down and the data will be pouring out with around one event a day to look at. Who said that? Yeah. Not, not before we saw the event. I don't well, think so. That's in your, in your last book. That yeah, I mean, that would be an optimistic. Oh, claim. I see. Oh, uh, yeah. As an optimistic claim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. People will always. People to have to say these things. In a you reasonable know. amount of time, such a dramatic improvement of the event rate that if something yeah, like this yeah. is right, the event rate should go up by a factor of thousand. Yes. Of advanced LIGO. Yeah. And they should be falling into our laps. You you have to be very very careful when you read these yeah. these things yeah. because I people mean, these say them. Yeah. These are statements that are. Mm -hmm design, you know, they may reflect people's optimism, they may reflect what people want to convince others about. I mean, when uh, the, the generation of detectors called Enhanced LIGO was built, mm -hmm. which was initial LIGO with a little bit of enhancement, yeah. part of the way towards advanced LIGO, uh, people were predicting that Enhanced LIGO will see gravitational waves. And I once said to one of the senior people in the field, you know, you've got no right to expect that because you, what you say is every time we increase sensitivity we find something we don't expect but here you're multiplying by zero because you've seen zero so far why do you think an increase in sensitivity is going to produce an effect and this person became so angry they got a hold of me and held me up against the walls and you don't understand anything <laughs> okay so people have you know scientists have to Keep their, keep their optimism up if they were to do this crazy stuff which eventually re reaches yeah. success. Mm -hmm. And so of course I was much, right in that How much did case. they actually promise in, in your view to the, say, to the public, to the funding agencies? Could they, say, could they, could they say if, if, if there was no, no sign of gravitational waves at all, uh, could they say, well, we haven't understood something? Or, what would be the reaction of, of people? Would they think, uh, oh, you guys are incompetent, no. or, or wow, you have detected something, or you have non detected something that's interesting, maybe Einstein is wrong? No. What would be the reaction? In the, if, if advanced LIGO, yeah. if it continued to be developed over three years, reached its predicted level of sensitivity, which is three or four times better than the current level of sensitivity, and it didn't see anything, people would be a little bit worried, but they would find reasons for why it didn't see it. It would be reasons mostly about cosmology and our lack of understanding of the cosmological universe. Just tuning, tuning back, I mean, the, the assumptions about yeah. the rate of black holes, about the strength... That's of right. I mean, let's take the thing that's been seen, which is an inspiraling binary black hole system. Nobody even knew they existed. I mean, really, this is one of the major discoveries this time, that binary that binary black holes have had time to circle round and collapse together in the age, during the age of the universe people didn't know that so you wouldn't have said oh there are there's something wrong because we should have seen binary black holes they've just said ah oh, binary black holes aren't there it wouldn't have been any great surprise it would have been a bit troubling but i mean the real trouble wouldn't have started until LISA, which is the gravitational wave detector in space, was launched. And now if that didn't see any gravitational waves, then you'd really have trouble for physics. Mm -hmm. But I think that should the, if advanced LIGO had never seen any gravitational waves, it would have caused a bit of worry, but it wouldn't have really caused deep trouble for physics. Mm -hmm. So you think they, they, in case they found nothing, um, they would have found justifications and, and everybody was was happy but no, people wouldn't really have been happy have, people wouldn't have been happy, happy but I mean uh, they would say okay there's a, a lower rate of, of, of 
events happening in the yeah. universe and this and that and let's and ask a, let's ask a look let's ask a practical question mm -hmm. i think what would have happened it would have been very difficult to get any more funding mm -hmm. for more advanced detectors that i think would have been difficult if advanced LIGO didn't see anything. But would it have been in a real trouble for physics? Would the people have to say there's something wrong with the theory of relativity? I don't think so. Yeah, that's interesting because uh, sometimes uh, the, the business of, of uh, searching for gravitational waves is uh, it's, it's called like butterfly hunters. Yeah, we, we, we're hunting the, the butterflies. But I mean, scientifically, I mean, shouldn't it be, uh, shouldn't the detection and the non-detection be on an equal level of, of uh, scientific insight? So you could even say, oh, that's interesting. I mean, at the very end, the result of the Michelson-Morley experiment was not the expected one, and it was even more interesting for physics. So how does this butterfly analogy really fly? Well, it's, it's not the case that... Uh there's a symmetry between finding something and not finding something. First of all, not finding something is very, very much more difficult than finding something. Okay? If you well, find something, <laughs> there it is. But not finding something as is, is, as you say, almost impossible because you've really got to prove that there's nothing wrong with your apparatus. And that's why you say, you say the Microsoft-Morley experiment, but nobody took a lot of notice of the Microsoft-Morley experiment, actually, when it first result. It, the Microsoft-Morley experiment was just counted as a failure. Yeah. It was an attempt to measure the velocity of the Earth through the yeah. ether, which failed. It didn't get interesting until the theory of relativity came along, when that was quite a lot later. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, the, it's the, like, like neutrino masses is another thing. Mm. I mean, direct neutrino masses is, you could call it a failure or something interesting because maybe they don't have mass, but, uh, yeah, but if the you proof they don't have is almost impossible. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very difficult. So you wouldn't, you know, it's a long, there was quite a long way to go before you could prove that there was something wrong with theories of gravitational waves. As I said, the thing that, would, that was vulnerable was astrophysical theories. People would have said there are fewer sources than we thought there were. And that's what would have been trouble. You'd have had to get, you'd have had to have detectors a lot more sensitive than advanced LIGO to really start to produce the kind of finding that would cause people to rethink physics. And I don't think that was going to happen until LISA, the space-based detector, was built. Mm -hmm. As it is, now that something has been found, I think it should be very easy to get more funding. I hope so, for more gravitational wave detectors and more sensitive gravitational wave detectors based on Earth. Mm -hmm. So you think the explanation of a possible non-detection would have been, well, finding astrophysical reasons, not um, gravitational waves do exist, but LIGO isn't able to measure it for principal reasons? That would be, that's, I think you call that uh, a question outside the envelope of legitimate questions. <laughs> so, what about? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's almost established that that uh, if gravitational waves exist, LIGO, in principle, is able to detect. Yeah, there would be. It would be many years down the road mm -hmm. before these more difficult questions would force themselves on people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, you mentioned that. There was a big um, fear in the community to claim false positive results. Yeah. And uh, one possibility uh, to deal with the problem was was uh, making blind injections. Is that right? Uh, was that the the fear of of uh, claiming false positive? No, I think paranoid about about uh, false positive claims and to be too conservative and, and uh, to set up a test that, that uh, prevents you from being too conservative is making this blind injection. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't think that was the, the main reason for the blind injections, but it did work that way. As you said, it's, uh, there, there's a danger in a field like this which is a, has had a bad reputation because of many claims that were made that were no longer believed, that people would become too, too conservative and refuse to believe anything. And that might have happened if the first event seen 
this time were much weaker, it might have been very difficult to get people to claim that they were real. As it happens, this one turns out to be very, very strong. Uh, but if they'd been weak, it would have been difficult. And then, yes, one of the reasons, one of the effects of the putting in the blind injections was to force people to take certain things seriously. But, you know, the blind injections were not all that successful. So there have been two blind injections, one called the Equinox event and one called and Big, Big Dog. Dog yeah. Yeah. But neither of them, in, and, and the community went all the way through, in the first case writing up a, at least the abstract of a paper, and in the second case writing a whole paper. But that whole paper didn't, the headline wasn't gravity waves discovered. It was only evidence for the existence of gravity waves. So even though it was a blind injection intended to look like a gravity wave, the community couldn't be persuaded to call it a full-scale discovery, at least not in the paper's title. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you think the community was too conservative? I think the community was too conservative. I mean, they wouldn't agree with me. but they, This is just me as an outsider. I think they're too conservative. Mm -hmm. Because of the bad reputation in because yeah. of the fear of, of, of making false positive claims. Yeah. As it's, okay. as it's so turned out, this hasn't turned out to be a problem for this event because mm -hmm. nobody is being too conservative now, just too secret. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what was the reason for the blind injections, in, in your opinion, in first place? Oh, well, the, the reasons for the blind injections was to give something for people to do, you know, and to have people rehearse the mechanism of making a detection, and it was very successful in that respect. The first blind injection, the Equinox event, it took 18 months to analyze. The second one took only six months. And then this real event took only five months. So and it's you an improvement. You it really. <laughs> what? You said really. <laughs> real. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, of course, when I'm acting as a native, I will talk in the native language. All this conversation, nearly all this conversation has been in native language. Yeah. So the real event has been, has, took about five months. So it's been successful in that way. And the other thing, the reason that caused people to love blind injections, or at least the administrators, is because they don't, they want to be very careful about the way anything is announced to the public. And they want to keep the res they want to try to keep the results secret until they're ready for their press conference. And if they can say to people, ah, oh, yeah, we're analysing something, but it may be a blind injection, mm -hmm. that's a way of keeping it secret. You're not in favour of the secret? I'm secrets. not in favour of it, yeah. no. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what could be potential risks of this blind injection? That, that might be a question of, of uh, again, outside of the envelope of legitimate questions, but uh, if you... The only risk is that is if somebody puts a blind injection in and doesn't tell anybody so that when they're looking for, a, they think they're investigating a real event, it's actually a blind injection. But the community, they were very, very careful about this. They spent a long time making sure that this event that's been discovered couldn't have been a malicious injection put in by some hackers somewhere or other. It's put a lot of effort into making sure that couldn't be the case. Okay. So, so the community have that what uh, that what the director uh, announced that they checked very carefully and they concluded that only very few people had the expertise knowledge to make such a fake signal, and uh, and they asked very carefully and so they concluded that it's it's very very unlikely. Yeah, I mean, interestingly enough, in the in the last resort to know that something isn't a malicious injection, or something like this, mm -hmm. is actually a matter of a sociological conclusion. I mean, this is some little trick I, some little game I sometimes play when I'm talking to physicists and other scientists. I say, how do you know that the moon landings weren't faked up in the Arizona desert? And they say, well, look, when the spacecraft went behind the moon, the radio signal faded out, so we know it was real. And I say, no, you don't. Obviously, if you were faking it, you'd do that. And they say, look at the flag, the way the flag hung in the moon's atmosphere. It shows that there was no air or no wind. I said, no, of course you'd fake that. That's easy. 
and all the technical things, it's easy to fake. I mean, Hollywood can fake anything, you know. Uh, so the reason why do we know that the Arizona, the moon landings weren't faked in the Arizona desert? We know they weren't because if they were, the Russians would have said so. So it's a, so, it's a social criterion. This a conspiracy of that size would have been impossible to keep secret. And eventually that's what it comes down to with knowing that the LIGO event wasn't a, a malicious injection. You, you look at the number of people that would have been required to do different very complicated things and mostly you know those people because they're the only people with the skills to do it and you say this is socially incredible. So you said you were surprised at the event of February 11th, I mean the announcement. Um, there was so, uh, such a quick agreement mm -hmm. that a gravitational wave has been detected. So what, uh, in your opinion, should have been a matter of debate? Um, well, first of all, I think one of the reasons that the nobody's questioning it very much is because the uh, two waveforms from the two different detectors match so very so very well but the official criterion for making a discovery these days at least among high energy physicists and that seems to be the rule that has been ex accepted by journals like physical review letters where it was published is that the, there must be a statistical significance level of five standard deviations. And um, if I was a determined critic, I think I would look very closely at just how these five standard deviations are generated. Because uh, it's not the same five, it's five standard deviations, but it's not generated in the same way as it is, say, with high energy physics yeah, where you see it's, many it's particles. It's not an easy question to decide. You no. dedicated an entire chapter in your book about yeah. whether to include the noise or not and it's called the little dog Little dog, so there's so all the, kinds of problems. Was that uh, 5.1 5 sigma was announced right now, was that the conservative way or was it the non-conservative way? It's okay, I mean you know, I don't think anybody's really seriously got any doubts but I'm, what I'm saying is, if I was a determined critic, I would be thinking, I would be trying to unpick the statistical procedure, which is, you know, interesting. It's an interesting procedure. So, that, for instance, we say uh, the chances of this happening being caused by noise is one chance in 200,000 years, okay? But at the same time, that calculation is based on only 16 days of running. Now, statistically, nothing, it's all correct. You know, it's all perfectly valid inferences. Uh, but if I wanted to think out of the box and question and, and, and be really awkward, I think that's one kind of thing that you could ask about. I mean, I don't think there's any future in asking about it, and I don't think there's any problem at all, and I don't think this event is ever going to go away, and I think it's real. But there, there would be ways to question it if you were determined to question it, and it's interesting that nobody is determined mm -hmm. to question it in those kinds of ways, except when you move to what we might call the fringe of science, people who don't believe in the theory of relativity and various other such people. And there's quite a big, quite a big organized physics fringe. And you can easily find questioning of the result on the fringe. So if you go to a preprint server called Vixra, mm -hmm. you've heard of that? Mm -hmm. You know it's the that's, opposite. That's the opposite of archive. It's the it's alternative yeah, to archive. Archive has a pretty rigid moderation it's policy. fairly rigid yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's hard for outsiders to get their papers into exactly yeah. but now you'll find at least two full papers on Vixra questioning the reality of the event mm -hmm. saying it's not real that it's a fake mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so but it's quite interesting that the mainstream doesn't seem to be questioning it at all mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that one possible reason that uh, 
you're already starting out from the assumption of a certain waveform and you're looking for that patterns of increasing frequency. Is yeah, that, that be a everything system? fits and everything is sort of large. Uh, the signal to noise ratio is extremely good and it fits with the expectations and it fits with the s expectations of sensitivity of the detector. It makes perfectly good sense that this detector at this early level of sensitivity, even though it's not its full design uh, level of sensitivity yet, should be able to detect such a powerful event in spiraling binary black holes mm -hmm. uh, because they give off a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. um, so everything fits and there's, there's no obvious problems. Mm -hmm. So I'm, what I'm saying, but the, um, as, a, as a sociologist, the question I'm always asking is, would this force you to believe if you were determined not to believe? And of course the answer is always no, because nothing can force you to believe, because you can always find some sub-hypothesis yeah, yeah. that you can relax, and, and in this case it's the fringe scientists who yeah. are doing it well, for us. Well, one could imagine stricter rules. I mean, if you have one detector, the signal could come from everywhere, right? If you have two detectors, you can say, oh, it's presumably, if you have two detectors and the coincidence, uh, it will come from a line on the sky. Mm. If you have three detectors, you have to determine the direction. Yeah. If you have four detectors, you even have an additional verification of the, of the speed of light. So, would that, in your opinion, I, I mean, would, would it be reasonable to, to demand that for detectors, so even another astrophysical signal, kind of a gold standard for... Well, you know, in, it's, it's very difficult in advance to say what is satisfactory. Um, for instance, uh, not many years ago, one of the leaders of the whole gravitational wave physics business said, we cannot make a detection unless we have a simultaneous detection of electromagnetic waves from the source. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but now nobody's asking for this. And now everybody's realized actually it's very, very hard to do that because until you do have four or five, four detectors or something like that, you cannot narrow down the point on the sky narrowly enough to know where to look. Mm -hmm. I mean... And you still have point light detections in time, so even if you detect it in one direction, so the other detector might not be able to focus its attention on them. No, I don't think that's a problem. I think mm. it's, if you're in doubt, mm. then you need several, detect, several detectors to see the... Uh, at least two detectors and pre preferably more to see the results simultaneously. I mean, before long we won't be in doubt any longer mm. and then one detector will be able to make a detection. Mm. But for now, whilst you're in doubt, you need backup from two or more detectors. Mm. But when you, you do, even if you had three detectors, that doesn't define a very narrow point on the sky. And when you look at the sky through a telescope, and a, a telescope detecting electromagnetic waves, there's lots of things going on all the time. Mm -hmm. So how do you know that particular thing is what you've seen with a gravitational wave? It turns out that this neat idea that we must have it correlated with an electromagnetic signal just doesn't work in the simple way that it seems to work. I mean, it seems to make a lot of sense. Oh, we'll correlate it with an electromagnetic signal. But actually, it turns out to be very, very difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, you go along, you feel your way in science, and here is a case where they've, felt they, they've stumbled into the fact that this, even though it's just two detectors, the two LIGO detectors, even though there's no possibility of any electromagnetic correlation, it's just convincing. Mm -hmm. And everybody's convinced by it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but not convinced, I think. And, and then you say to the wider world, we're convinced because it's five sigma. But actually, it's not, that's not what's convinced the community. The community can just kind of see and feel that this has got to be a real thing, and more because of the coherence of what happened in the two detectors. Five sigma, in a way, is almost irrelevant mm -hmm. to the community, but it's important for the outer, outside world. How much did the theoretical expectation contribute to it? I, I, it's an, an, in an interesting passage of one of your books, I think you said, um, even if you're an expert, uh, most of the things you know, you know from hearsay. And uh, even if you're an expert in your narrow field, a large part is, is hearsay. So 
What about the gravitational uh, waves community from a theoretical point of view? How many people are really able to, I mean, to, to calculate the theory from their own expertise, from their own knowledge? Oh, very, are able to say? Yeah, very few are able to, to do those calculations from their own knowledge. It's an extremely difficult thing. But even if you can do it, it's not so straightforward. So what you do is you build up template banks from which you compare the signal to the template bank. But there are 250 million, 250,000 templates, okay? So some people would say, well, if there's 250,000 templates, it's hardly surprising you managed to match it to one of them. So maybe that's not quite so, so though it fits exactly the model, it's, if, as I said, I'm not, I'm not complaining about what's happened, but I'm saying if there was a determined critic out there, these are the sorts of questions they could ask. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, you also, uh, as many in the community, you were also astonished a little bit about, I mean, the, the, the clarity and, and the perfect appearance of the signal. It's so, it matches so perfectly the expectations that, well, if you think about other discoveries, there was always something that didn't match the expectation. In this case, there is yeah, well, agreement. let me be honest to, to say that I am not sufficient of an expert to be able to say mm -hmm. that it matched exactly. I'm just reporting what the scientists said, that it matched exactly to an astonishing extent. Okay, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's what they think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let me come to, to uh, conclusive um, questions. Um, you uh, as a sociologist, you, you worked for decades in this field. Uh, you, uh, you were certainly in a privileged position, like an embedded journalist or something. Um, how, how much could that um, well, affect your, your uh, uh, judgment of the entire field? Or, or would it be, I mean, could it be that, that people feel bad if you say something that, that does not correspond to their worldviews or things like that? Yeah, I, mean, I, I have, but I mean, uh, of course, it's always a problem. Every, everybody does work like I do. You have to be careful that you're not going native, as they say. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a problem for me because I think when I wear my native's hat, I just think this discovery is brilliant. I mean, it's an incredible thing. Uh, 1,300 million years ago, whatever it is, you have, uh, you have two black, black holes inspiring into each other, producing the equivalent energy of three suns, mm -hmm. a mass of three suns turning totally into, into energy, uh, coming by, hitting the Earth, and causing an effect equivalent to one ten thousandth of the diameter of a proton. I mean, the thing is completely crazy and wonderful. But I have to step back from that and just point out, oh, well, it's not really that. All we've seen is a few little tiny electrical signals holding mirrors together in an interferometer. How is it we get from there to these kind of much more marvellous claims? Uh, so I have to be able to switch between being a native in that kind of way and and feeling the same wonder in the scientific result as the scientists, and being able to step back and generate some estrangement or scepticism. So it's a difficulty for me, but it's something that every sociologist has to be able to do. And on the other hand, when I write my books, I usually write them, I usually, it usually turns out that I'm having some kind of row or other with the scientists, and that reassures me a bit as well. <laughs> well, one thing that appears to be sure is that uh, February 11 has changed the field, so to speak. Yes. Um, and you even see that, say that in your books, uh, at the risk, uh, or you even predict that, uh, that these considerations will be trampled over by the enthusiasm yeah, after, after the first detection. Um, do you think that there will be a loss of interest now in these sociological investigations in the field? 
Have you noticed something in this direction? Or well, uh, is there a lot of interest in the sociological investigation anyway? I mean, you know, I'm quite an unusual sociologist these days, yeah. sociologist of science, because the way that the field has changed somewhat, yeah. it's now much more concerned with yeah. the environment, uh, with uh, corruption in science. There are very few people studying the pure sciences in the way that I do it. Mm -hmm. So what all I can say is uh, what I'll try and do uh, because I'm old now, I'm 72, so going on 73, so I'm, I can't do this much longer. Uh, and I'm very pleased, in a sense, this kind of, I'm not sure if, it's, if, it, if I've finished, um, but it certainly is a reasonable ending point, the fact that we've now officially discovered gravitational waves, we've seen them. But I'll certainly try and arrange that somebody will take over and continue because I think the field of gravitational wave astronomy is going to be very, very exciting. And there are going to be interesting changes. The way that the criteria for detection change. As I said, I think before long a single machine, a single detector will be able to will be counted as having seen a gravity wave. Now, I mean, uh, could it be that, I mean, uh, that up to now it was in a certain way tolerated because they had, so to speak, uh, very little to do, <laughs> the real things that, that uh, this uh, uh, sociological project was, was tolerated and, and welcome because uh, it, was, it was kind of an activity in a field with very, very few activities. And now, could it be that they say, uh, oh, we, we started now the astronomy, we don't need any more the sociology? Oh, you mean among the scientists? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, 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 I think that's just the wrong way around. The scientists didn't want me in the field at all at, at the beginning. <laughs> it's been very hard work, at least initially, to gain people's trust uh, and to gain the point where they're, now they quite like me, but it was hard. So I think uh, I, will, if I'm, if I, I think if somebody's going to follow on from me, I will try and make sure yeah. that they are. Somebody else, so the you, scientists will you're trust you receiving re requests from all field of physics and they're, oh, what interesting things this guy has done. I have had one or two, two actually. Another field yeah, <laughs> one or two, but not many. Yeah. And the difficulty is it's very hard to find somebody who can do this stuff mm -hmm. because you've got to be ready to try and understand and embed yourself in the technical understanding as well as do some sociology. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure what it means for my own subject and the future of it. So you're not, you're not sure that, that scientists will continue to like the scrutiny of, of sociology? I think scientists will continue to like the kind of scrutiny that I gave it, but I'm not sure that that means they would like the scrutiny of all my colleagues, mm -hmm. some of pe people who don't approach the subject in the same kind of way, mm -hmm. who won't mostly want to criticise, you know. Is there one, um, well, one, one lesson for science from sociology you would like to tell? <laughs> in, yeah. In one, one sentence? Or... I, I think that the, the, let's say that the policy implication of, the, of work like mine and the, for science is about public understanding of science. And at the moment, I'm, I'm a sort of person who's not very happy with the way people think about the public understanding of science. On the one hand, you have books like A Brief History of Time, Stephen Hawking's book, or The Elegant Universe by Brian Greene. And these things become bestsellers. But no, none of their readers understand them at all. So, you know, essentially you're reaching towards the iconography of religion. A brief history of time is like people have it on their shelves like they used to have the Latin Bible on their shelves. This is thing, something they worship, but they don't understand. And I don't like that kind of pop, uh, popularization of science. And I don't like the popularization of science which goes with the uh, press conference and the pulling of the result out of the hat. Like the magic. Press, yeah. Like, what? Well, for the Nobel Prize, this is the next Nobel Well, no, no, I'm not so worried about the Nobel Prize, but it's the magic aspect of it. We're magicians, we pull out, pull out another wonder of the universe. I don't like wonders of the universe. What this science is, is, is an incredibly difficult craft practice. It's fantastic, the measurements that have been made. The measurements are extraordinary. And that's the face of science. And they're not only extraordinary, they're also fallible. 
So it's this fallible craftspeople, who, and that is, I think, the true meaning of science. And the other thing about it is it's got to be at its heart uh, an activity which is done with huge integrity. And I believe, especially in these days, where all the institutions which we used to take as icons of integrity, like the banks, financial institutions, insurance companies, athletics, sports, all these things yeah. are now corrupt and can no longer be trusted. Yes. But I think we need science as an institution that can lead us and show us how to act with integrity. So these are the lessons that I think a proper sociological analysis of science would bring out. Okay, thank you very much.